All right, thank you so much for having me. So um, my talk today is titled Jet GPT, GPT for you and friends, and those models will change your life. So in the past uh, few months, however, I mean, the talk is still roughly the same. I noticed that there are a lot of um, hyperbole and um, misinformation about uh, those large AI models. In my talk today, my goal is to dispel some of that and maybe also show a little bit hands on what's going on. But without further ado, let's do something fun. Yeah, so, so what you're seeing and hopefully right also hearing is actually pretty much state of the art, um, what is happening in general so right now. So the one of the frontiers that has been tracked is how to generate music with a realistic synchronized voice in, by a company called Uno. And the truth here are just basically asking ChatGPT, hey, make a song that makes .NET developers look good compared to Python developers, and then put it in that engine that creates like a rap type of music in this case, and is able to continue the previous rap. I won't like show, play the whole song to you right now. I can give it to you later on as a video link, maybe, because we don't have only very limited time. So briefly about me, I've been in that industry here for over 25 years, um, getting close to 30 years actually, and did fun stuff already in the 1990s like virtual reality. However, a lot of years I worked in the enterprise industry because there was frankly no money to be made in, um, <coughs> sorry, and <laughs> I'm sorry, I need to, uh, sorry, um, in, um, which reality and aligned fields. But around 2014, I really discovered my passion and added tools like Connect for Windows, then HoloLens, and then also applied artificial intelligence to my arsenal to tell more and bigger stories. I present a fair amount of conferences and events. That's why I have those MVP and regional director designations. I like to, in a lot of my talks, I like to um, give a little bit of context where are we coming from like all this pattern here like how we interact with computers this was 1946 where you program computers by basically re-plugging cables and then we had the punch card readers a big innovation to change computer programs but then our paradigm to interact with computers was really 1963 when the mouse was invented and then 1968, when the first terminal with a graphical user interface and a mouse was introduced. Even the touchscreen is an invention from the 1960s. So everything we're doing is basically 55 years old. And the overarching pattern is we, as human beings, need to understand a way how we interact with the computer and need to learn how the computer wants to be interacted with. So the bigger question is, like in user experience design, how does a computer understand our intent of what we want to do? And this is, I think, what motivates everything in um, also in metaverse, mixed reality, but also in artificial intelligence. How can a computer like naturally understand what we want? Okay, that's to ground it a little bit. I'm skipping over the agenda because I'm modifying it a little bit, but um, let me show you a little demo at the very beginning here. Um, it's called Whisper, and Whisper, I have a little app that uses Whisper. Whisper is, um, is an, a model that was um, created by OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, and OpenAI has been criticized for not open sourcing a lot of things anymore. It's, um, their GPT-3 models, for example, in which, um, were never open source, but GPT-2 you could download and run on your hardware. Now, they published Whisper, and Whisper has a few interesting properties. Let me do something really quickly here. Hallo, ich kann jetzt plötzlich Deutsch sprechen und hoffentlich wird das jetzt in Echtzeit übersetzt. Well, it, 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 um, so what you're seeing here, it translated what I said in German correctly. Hello, I can now suddenly speak German and it was translated in real time. And then it, it, it hallucinated because there was some background noise, probably like, um, thank you for watching. So, but the key takeaway, there are two takeaways here. The first takeaway is this is running on my local machine. So this model here, which can translate in real time and transcribe also English, is running on local hardware on a, a regular computer notebook. And there are a bunch of similar things coming out. 
a bigger point I want to make, however, is um, the associated paper that came out with it found an interesting observation. So they built those whisper models in two, in two versions. One whisper model was only trans transcribing English text to English text and was trained in different sizes. And you can see the sizes are basically a function of the training of LOPs, the floating point operations. And they found then between 10 to the power of 20 and 10 to the power of 21, um, when because they had two models. So the so English only transcription and then the multilingual version and, and also multitask version. Multitask means it is able to transcribe and also to translate to English. Transcribe, let's say, from the source language to the source language and then to transcribe to English. Suddenly here, this uh, blue, um, the English line, um, this is the errors found or the errors that occur. The multilingual and multitask model gets better at transcribing English. So again, to, to a model that has been optimized of only transcribing English text to, um, well, as English spoken um, language to English text has gotten worse in transcribing than a mo model that also learned, let's say, German, Spanish, and so on. And again, the context is this can run on your own hardware. This underlines a pattern that we're seeing in large AI models. The larger they get, suddenly they get some somewhat sometimes surprising capabilities. And a, a common sense explanation for that is that they see some nuances that exist in language that because be by having seen more different things. The a common sense um, explanation for this, for example, the Spanish language has two different ways how you say I love you. Like the in English, we say love, 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 almost for everything. I love my computer, I love my wife, I love my, I uh, love God. And in Spanish, typically on the daily basis, you would say te quiero to your, to your spouse, to your partner, to your boyfriend, girlfriend. But if you want to be a little bit more poetic, a little bit more bolder, you could say te amo, which is amar. Um, this is a, like a slightly different um, way of expressing it. Te quiero literally would mean I want you, right? So there are nuances in languages that uh, are more easily expressed in, um, in some languages explicitly that are kind of hidden in the original language sometimes. And this is maybe what makes those models able to derive deeper insights when they just see more things hidden in other languages. So let's 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 have a um, quick look at um, the foundation of it all, right? I don't want to bore you too much of the theory, but I think it's important to ground that um, conversation. This is a, a tokenizer. So everything when you work on those large language models are tokens. Tokens means when I say, here is some text I am typing in um, about the metaverse. You see, that um, in the bottom here, those de 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 delineations is basically an encoding of each of those characters here are one token. So white space and S-O-M-E sum is one token. Metaverse here is two tokens, right? Um, and here the white, well, meta, meta with the white space before. Now, this is because those models need to be able to work on language and do that in a very efficient way because they have basically a token, let's say a library dictionary, however you may call it, that has been optimized for the those languages that they have been trained on much. So in German, when I say, um, hello, ich spreche hier auf einer Konferenz, which means hello, I'm talking here at a conference, then you see that a lot more tokens are being used. Um, so the um, for example, conference, conference here, compared to, let's say, English conference, um, it's be one token, but in German, one, two, three, four tokens are necessary. Um, because German is just not as common as English in the training data set, so they they used more uh, tokens for um, for English, my mean unique tokens, and German has to live with the rest, and similar for other languages. The side effect of this is that, um, well, if you want to work in other languages, as with those large models, often you pay in tokens. You pay as a multiplication of tokens when you use 
for example, um, the APIs um, of OpenAI or Azure OpenAI. And so it quickly can get more expensive to work on other languages than English. But it's also, and that's an interesting side effect, is that those um, other languages, um, it, let's say, basically the brain of those language models need to suddenly work on a lot more individual things compared to an English. So it's kind of harder for that um, AI brain to work on other languages a little bit. Yeah, it still does an amazing job, but it's just 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 for um, to to simplify that. The transformers that you may have heard about um, coming from the paper, attention is all you need, were, were introduced because there was a challenge in large language model or in, lang in language processing, meaning language typically, well, those are sequences. We like, um, here's a sentence and this sentence has um, one word after the other, right? So, and if you want to process that, typically I start with Let's say it was here for foundations and tokens and attention. If you want to do AI on that, uh, there's a model type called RNN. And uh, to say, to simplify it, they needed to process one step after the other and to train it, they needed to then do back, back propagation all the way back, which led to one thing that it was really, really hard to parallelize things. As you know, graphics cards and other processing architectures benefit from massively parallel operations. So this paper here, the core thing they introduced was a very clever way to make it possible to um, do language processing partially in parallel. Um, so without going too, too much into the details, right? So um, now when those models have been trained, what happens then? Like the models have been trained and then uh, behind the scenes, there is some basically file that runs somewhere or some on some hardware. And let's say, the, like, and um, those are called the model weights. The model weights here, they connect things. Like, let's say, I give it an, like some sentences, for example, the cat sat on the mat, and then, um, and then a target sentence, the same thing. You see that suddenly it has, if it creates relationships between entities in this input and output text, yeah? Those are basically the, the weights of the model. And you can see that, let's say, you get, let's go to a random layer. For example, here, um, this uh, token set has a strong connection to the word cat on the right side. Um, so the previous word and also to the separator um, of that says like this sentence has it's found its end. To visualize it further, um, you like this is a very, very simplified way, but you see, for example, that this is on this layer two, head zero, whatever that means now, that seems that the model has learned to find or the, the next token in a sentence, right? In some other layers, it may have found, okay, that there's um, sitting is always related to something, like cat needs to sit on something. And there's another layer where it may, for example, point to the previous, um, for example, here, a lot of the relationship to the previous token is established. So overall, doing all this math behind the scenes, then the model is able to predict what would be the next token. Yeah? So that's very, very highly simplified. Like how does it do that? Well, um, that's a result of the math because it has been basically trained on a lot of text. And when you interact with ChatGPT, you are used to specific um, ways to interact with the model. You ask it a question and it responds to you, but why does it happen, right? So those models have seen, again, a lot of text and they're predicting what's next in the text. So Bloom is a model that is more um, closer to the original GPT-3, which I currently, um, is not really um, that active anymore as an API. You have ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is different in the, some sense. So let's have a look at that example model. Like, why does it matter? Let's say um, the sky is blue. Oh, no, sorry. What color is the sky? And you would expect now that the model maybe gives you a good answer. But well, it's a question of the grammar exercise meant to evolve. And it creates some weird text here, right? But why is that? Well, because the model doesn't really understand what is the question. Um, what do we want? It just sees that sentence and tries to complete it. And this could have seen like somewhere in Reddit, somewhere in a novel, somewhere in a book, 
that something else could come as a probability. But if you, we say a few other things, what color is grass? Green. What color is snow? White. And then if we say it again, we have a little bit higher chance because we gave it more examples how it should look like. Right? Oops, let's try it again. Uh, Craig was bored, it still wasn't enough. So, but if I have, let's say, I say the question here, my right? question, what color is the sky? Uh, is, sorry, is grass? A answer, Q, and of course I'm typing all the time. I'm almost there. It's because my screen is here on my right side, so I need to bend my head a little bit in order to present to you all. And when I say A now, I gave it a, a few more hints that there's maybe a question answer game to be played here. And maybe it's doing better than I see. So now it continues. Now it says actually blue. What color is yellow? Red. And and so it, it then it goes a little bit on a on a on a weird rampage. But um because it also didn't understand when to terminate a response. When should I finish completing, right? So, but here, basically we gave it examples and this technique is called few short learning. I gave it here two examples of what I want. And um, then the third um, question has a better idea what do I want? Oh, well, this is probably a question answer game and somebody wants an answer. Now, how did we get to what we see in chat GPT, right? So, Again, ChatGPT and GPT-3 has been trained on a lot of data. Let's skip over this, but just for the sake of it, it's like 150 uh, times um, pretty much as um, the content as all of Wikipedia. And the training effort here is, has been um, growing in basically 100-fold since the release of this paper, Attention is All You Need. And so this is like 100 times as much training compute necessary. But interesting enough, the um, the cost of the training compute for GPT-3 is rumored to have been in the tens of millions and that similar happened to those models that were released, um, the largest models when that initial paper attention all you need came out. We have a higher growth rate in AI um, training speed and performance than predicted by Moore's law currently, um, because they find a lot of improvements, a lot of algorithmic improvement and so on, just to keep it in the back of your mind. Now, what they did is they wanted to make sure that people get responses um, to questions they want to ask. So they did something they call, that's called first supervised training. So they hired basically a bunch of people all over the world, um, crowdsourced, um, rumors say partially may have been in Nigeria and so on, who wrote question and answer pairs initially. So explain the moon landing to a six-year-old and somebody typed in, some people went to the moon and so on. And then they also had people rating um, outputs of those models and say, oh, this was a good response or not. The next step, however, they uh, didn't just, uh, it wasn't enough to do that. They trained a separate AI model that was able to like basically say, is that a good response for human standards or not? And this, Separate AI model then um, that was then say, hey, explain to the moon landing to a six year old. And then there was a few responses, was able to say, well, the, this response is better than that response. And then this AI model was used to automatically run with automatic generations of the base model. And so to optimize then that base model over and over and over again. And then we went back to step one and also did a little bit more supervised fine tuning. So that is the secret sauce that is behind those, um, let's say, uh, those, so chat models or instruct models. Um, the chat GPT further was improved to be able to respond to multi-turn conversations, meaning that it understood there's like a, like a different people interacting, meaning the assistant and the user. Now, you may have heard about GPT-4, of course. GPT-4 the architecture even of the model is not publicly documented. So when it first was announced, there was a bunch of papers there that said how awesome it is, that it has a bigger, bigger context windows, that's the number of tokens it can process, and um, has um, amazing capabilities. 
and is partially almost intelligence in the sense of artificial general intelligence. However, um, they were very secretive what the model does. Some rumors were that uh, when while GPT-3 was 175 billion parameters, that it may be like um, basically trillions of parameters large. Um, what has been leaked over time in several interviews is that it may be actually so-called mixture of experts model. With the mixture of expert models differs from that there is a so-called router and um, so-called expert model. So an expert model would be one model that's maybe really good in dealing with source code, like program code. Another model may be really good in maybe translating text and so on. So and so they're the first component that acts as a router and then picks one or selection of models that then basically compete to be experts to give you better token predictions. Now, why is it relevant? Why do they do this little trick? Because um, the model sizes make it extremely expensive to run those large language models, the larger they get. And with this trick, let's say, let's call it trick, they're, they're able to, let's say, run models that are only let's say, for example, the rumored size is 220 billion parameters on a, on one um, infrastructure versus needing to run, let's say, a trillion parameter model where there may not even infrastructure available yet that can run that efficiently. Yeah, so um, let's skip over that quickly. There are a bunch of other um, large language models available. Um, let's say, for example, Llama is really well, pretty popular nowadays because you can actually download the Llama model and run it on your own hardware. Even while, for example, Google's um, Palm 2 model is something you can only access uh, as a web service. And there are a bunch of other models available. Um, you have, in a sense, almost a competition between those models as a service who are very often extremely large that it's not feasible to try to run it on your own hardware. And then the models that maybe are in a size that you could still run on your own computer. So as a size comparison, the largest Llama 2 model currently is 70 billion param parameters compared to the GPT-3 model that was one of 75 billion parameters. Um, so it is um, like two and a half times smaller or let's say GPT-3 is two and a half times larger than Llama. Um, to, however, um, the performance interesting thing enough is um, almost good enough. Let's say there are a bunch of other um, um, related models. So as similar to what we have seen with, um, how do you call it, um, this whisper, at a specific model size, interesting things happen. For example, suddenly at a specific model size, and again, measured in um, in floating point, training um, a scale, suddenly models can do some types of arithmetic. Still, uh, models will never probably be able to be perfect in an actual num numeric math because that's not their forte. But for example, some things like um, understanding words in context or Persian question and answers, those are benchmarks that suddenly get um, a lot better with a larger model size. Now, the other extreme, like larger model sizes, like, okay, we make models larger and larger and larger and larger, and suddenly they can do amazing things. You may have heard about that there's a Phi 1.5 model set by Microsoft, where they try to, where they train a very small model, and it is actually has a similar performance in some regards as even, let's say, a GPT-3 model for some specific use cases. Now, they, What's the reason behind it? There are people who say, okay, instead of letting a model read the whole internet, what if we can train a model with more quality data? So the first example of that I found or that uh, that tries to try to be systematic about it was called Tiny Stories. So they tried to see how small can a model be and still speak coherent English? Like, for example, um, coherent English would mean it is able to continue some things in a logical way. For example, Lily likes cats and dogs. She asked her mom for a dog and her mom said no. So in instead, she asked, uh, what could she have asked for, right? Uh, well, for example, a logical thing would be her dad for a cat. But see, even some really, really large models, for example, um, in comparison, GPT-2, again, not three, 
with 1.5 billion parameters is um, was kind of like her dad. They brought it to our head, and so it it kind of didn't semantically respond correctly. Whereas this optimized model, at like basically you have almost 100 times well, what 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 does I say? Like 33 times smaller, uh, well, actually 50 times smaller than GPT-2 XL was able to give a correct response and you can you can find similar things so there are indications that there may be a lot of opportunity to make smaller models that have really good results if you get really good quality input and that's where a lot of research is going on in the future now let's uh, make it a little bit more real so what I wanted to show you to ground the conversation is um, what is behind all this, right? So this is a little example here. No, we don't want to update this. It's just basically some program code running in Visual Studio code um, that's um, um, .NET Interactive here. And we, oh, sorry, I need to um, yeah, set the credentials. We connect to the model and then we ask the model to do something, right? We generate some text. Yeah. It's, um, and, oh, I'm, I, I'm not sharing the right screen, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so, um, so, but the, the key thing is let's generate some text. So what you're seeing here is this is Azure OpenAI behind the scene. Azure OpenAI in the, is basically you, you say like, give me a completion. And then it has also some options to put a filter for hate speech or for, self-harm, violence, to make it a little bit safer to interact with the model. And finally, it gives you a response. And the response is, like it tells me something, the average human blinks around 15 to 20 times per minute. It did what I wanted it to do. And the interesting thing is it gave me a finish reason stop. So the model here, and that's relevant for you all, is able to say, well, I generated something and I believe that's a complete response. And it has been trained to do so. So let's um, continue a little bit later and uh, more. And here we say, hey, we give it another parameter like max tokens. Here, your model, you're only allowed to generate four tokens. Now, please tell me something. And here, the interesting thing is that the model, um, like, started to generate something in the, and then stopped generating because it reached the maximum amount of token it was able to, uh, was allowed to generate. So four tokens in this case. Now, the consequence of this here is that you can then continue. Let's say, for example, here's a little program code that say, okay, if the model generation uh, finished with stop, then we're done. But if the model generation is not stopped, then we should continue. So this will result in a little loop. Then, hey, it's continuing like token by token to generate some text. Yeah. Okay, so as you see, this is in token in an iteration of two tokens. You may want to do that sometimes to have more granular control um, of what is generated because again, you pay the, the model generation per token. And sometimes when you say, let's say generate thousand tokens, this the result may not what you want to be. So you may choose, for example, to generate like hundred tokens first, have a look at it and then continue later on. Let's say, uh, let's continue here then, but this was a regular text generation. What we now see here is the chat GPT style. Chat GPT has like three different things. Like we have a chat message, um, the so-called system message, and then we have a chat message with a question, like say with a role user. And when we send that and we say in the system message, we define the system behavior. So the model has been optimized to follow the system matches more than other parts of that whole prompt. Behind the scenes, this is all a big prompt to the model. So all a big string you send to the model in a basically data structure, in this case, uh, case a JSON data, data structure. And uh, we told it to be friendly and to answer in rhyme. So, and surprisingly enough, it, well, it, generated some text and the text says, from Bellevue to Redmond, here's a wave, get, get onto I-405 and you'll soon be on the play. So it followed what I wanted to, to do, but like this 
can you rely on this? Can is this like or is this so called so called hallucination? The models have some world knowledge, but in, it only they try mm. to pull it in, but it only approximates what, in a sense, based on how you enter the model. So this could be a completely wrong thing or it could be outdated. So wouldn't it be nice, and this is relevant for you because you may have heard about co-pilots and functions and all those things that are coming out, if we could combine what those larger AI models do with some um, like reliable information out of, let's say, a different computer system. Let's say you ask about an employee's age and then you're looking up into an employee database instead of asking, like making the, ask the model to make up the employee's um, age. So let's continue here quickly. Oops, I think I, um, let's try again. Sometimes that it loses um, the state. Um, here's a different um, way to interact with the model, by the way, it's so-called streaming. Um, for those for developers here, this is basically a way how you can, um, in a non-blocking way, get the responses from a model because the model behind the scenes generates like token by token and with the so-called streaming endpoints, similar things exist in Python or you can also use, um, um, in this case, it's a C Sharp. Um, here you interact with a model like really token by token and it can respond to uh, react to everything that the model does little by little. Now, the key thing when we talk about copilots is something that you want to have a function and the model mm -hmm. should know the function. The function, let's say, would be um, um, let's say a fictional function that is able to get directions. Let's could hook mm -hmm. up to Bing Maps or to Google Maps. And I apologize for some for the long pings and bings in the background because I needed to share some audio before. Um, I still get some notification on my computer currently. So so we told the model like there's a function get route from A to B, mm -hmm. and so function has a different a description, gets the route from direct from location A to location B and has two parameters, like the source basically from for our route description and the destination or the start of the destination. So, so when we initialize that behind the scenes, what does it do? Well, uh, it basically creates a JSON object and this model has been trained behind the scenes to understand this JSON object. So that's what ChatGPT and some other models have been now trained to do. So if we now ask the same question, like give me the directions from um, Redmond, uh, from Bellevue to Redmond, what does the model do now? So there's something interesting happens here. Suddenly it says the finish reason is a function call. Like, so the same question like, hey, give me the directions, but what is the message? The message is, okay, from the role assistant, so the model gives us the response back. It like said, okay, I think I identified a function call. And it is able to do that because it has been, again, trained to detect function calls specifically. And it has a really good semantic understanding of input text. So it was able to say, hey, this input parameter location A Somebody asked about Bellevue and location B, the destination, somebody asked about Redmond. Now, this is also what happens when you use a plugin in ChatGPT, or if you use a copilot, let's say that may be able to work with your M365 and through Microsoft Graph. So behind the scenes, the model has been introduced to some, let's say, function calls. So, and then is able to say, hey, I'm gonna call like a, a root description. That's also the reason when you use ChatGPT and if you have, have been able to try out plugins, why there's a limitation of how many plugins you can activate. Because this model, like this prompt, what you send the model, if you go back all to the beginning when I asked if like the sky is blue, is the sky blue, now would have a lot of text, mm -hmm. would have all this like we calling like, hey, you are a friendly AI system, you answer in rhyme. And by the way, you have the function get route from A to B, and this has input parameters. And oh, by the way, maybe you have the graph API, and this has input parameters. And this gets longer and longer and longer. So that's why 
there's a limitation of how, about how many plugins you can use. Yeah. The next thing you may have heard about is that it's like chat on your da own data. And I want, also wanted to dem demystify that a little bit and call the function now would be then. So basically when you would have identified the function, then you would then as a developer need to call it now. It's so-called embeddings. What are embeddings? Embeddings are is basically a way for the AI model to have some text and then give you a bunch of numbers. The numbers are a vector, like a vector just pointing, like in the most simpler case, like two-dimensional, like an arrow in a, on a on a on a screen, or three dimensions um, in a three D space, like you know it from the metaverse, um, saying direction and location and things like that. But now you can do some interesting things, like because the vectors um, are subject to math, you can calculate things. For example, the cosine similarity between vectors, which is basically the dot product. Um, in this case, um, here mm. um, divided by the magnitude multiplied. multiplied. So let's say some helper function. And now we want to see a few of those embeddings and um, and um, calculate those. Let's say if we have one sentence. John really does like ice cream. John really does dislike ice cream. John really doesn't like ice cream and alpacas licks base rock. So there are a few interesting things that happen here. Um, when we're comparing now here, um, we're comparing liking ice cream and doesn't like ice cream. We get a number that's pretty high. It's 95% if you want to think over the percentages, the probabilities. And um, the, and between liking ice cream and disliking, so doesn't like and dislike, it's almost the same as also 95%. And the similarity is, of course, higher when we compare doesn't like ice cream and doesn't like uh, dislike ice cream. However, comparing liking ice cream and alpaca space, like space rock, you get a lower number. Now, this is exactly what happens when you use chat GPT or chat on your own data. Behind the scenes, there's really, really long text in your document. Um, they calculate those embeddings, those large vectors, and then whatever you search for, they also calculate embeddings for and then find those that have the closest match. Like that's what happens behind the scenes. So some more advanced, um, Method, method, for example, um, in an Azure Cognitive Search that also try to do the other similarity ranks and mix and match them. Um, John Montgomery posted about that, I think, just a few days ago. John Montgomery is one of the leaders in, in Azure um, AI. And um, that uh, you can do better results to using different um, mixing and matching, like let's say pure vector search with other similarity made, um, um, how do you call it, metrics. Now, um, you you may guess already why this is done. Let's say, for example, if you're looking for something um, in a traditional search query and you would want to find or people really like an ice cream, suddenly you may also get people who dislike ice cream because semantically disliking ice cream is actually pretty similar to liking ice cream. Yeah, so there's a lot of gotchas there. So keep that in mind. Mm. To um, to illustrate that graphically, um, however, there are a lot of other things that you can use those um, embeddings for that make exploring your own data also maybe in 3D space interesting. And I wanted to, to connect that here if I can only Come on, I need to stop my presentation quickly to so go and drag and drop my visual, studio, uh, my visual studio over here. So what I did here, I, I did that was from a, from a different conference. I basically um, have different topics here. Topics could be, for example, artificial intelligence, could be databases, and had some abstracts, like for example, where and I calculated abstracts for those different talks. And like I wanted to see now, um, and then I did something that's called dimensionality reduction and here so-called primary component analysis. But to say it simply, I have 1,536 dimensions and I want to reduce it to um, three dimensions so I can plot it. So I try to remove things that were like uh, independent, like their methodologies and libraries for that, don't be worried about it. But then I can I was able to do interesting things. Like here, if we have artificial intelligence, you see the talks that 
have something like how AI tools look like ChatGPT, ChatGPT, Azure OpenAI, and Cognitive Services, um, the power of ChatGPT in large language models, they're closer to artificial intelligence. Let's say, for example, then um, hands-on lab develop an ASP.NET Core app uh, with entity framework, which is, uh, on the other hand, closer to the .NET framework. On the other side, on the top here, you have, um, what is it, choosing the right data store, um, and I apologize, I didn't color everything right, which is closer to databases. So you can do really interesting things, exploring semantic context uh, with so-called embedding models. Embedding models, let's think of it as a variation of um, large language models. Um, it's, it's used in between to represent, like say, semantics in a way that a computer can understand. Okay, so... Um, I wanted to show you those things because I, and even so I used a lot more of my talk than I initially planned to do because I think it's important to ground all these conversations that we're having right now, right? So, um, like, because you have seen ChatGPT at this point, probably enough. One interesting thing I have, it's a pre-recorded demo that's also relevant in, in the metaverse context. What if we could program with uh, computers in a, let's say, in a different way, right? I mean, you know GitHub Copilot, but how would it be, this is so-called sandbox, I'm sorry, if we could just type what we want with visual objects and get them, in, like the source code created and it would be executed right away. So we create a cube, create a sphere, like let's uh, sphere rotate around the cube and then do something with it. And it basically generates JavaScript code, in this case using Babylon JS, which is a really fun framework to do interactive 3D content. And um, it's also like, a, I think you can think of it also as a game engine for JavaScript. And then you can even do advanced things like mouse overs and so on. Um, I presented this at a conference in Greece, so that's why I have the Greek flag here. And um, now, because I wanted to honor the Greek, my Greek friends here, we're letting the German sphere explode when I click on it. This is sped up a little bit, so the models may take a little bit longer to generate this content. And But there's something interesting, like people say, like, is English our new programming language? As, like I say, not even that. You can even work in like another language, in, in this case in Greek, and op interact with your visual artifact set. And that I think will be very interesting also for metaverse applications in the future. Um, we're not there yet, but think of maybe two, three years, maybe even less in the future, and the way we maybe build applications may change fundamentally. Like, I promised to talk a little bit about uh, risk and biases and image generation. For image generation, um, I wanted to show briefly, um, actually, I wanted to show stable diffusion really, really quickly. Stable diffusion, here um, I use the so-called automatic 11.11, .11. Web UI of it, which I start. And this is an image generation that runs on my own computer, um, meaning it uses my GPU and my notebook. It doesn't need anything in the cloud. So, and this is the latest version of it, SDXL base. So, which is, means I can use up to 768. And here I have a text prompt, and the text prompt behind the scenes gets translated to so called image embedding. And I cannot explain the process in detail, but just uh, to encourage you, try it out on your hardware and there's some websites that you can use it. You don't need to be bound, let's say, to um, the model space you need to subscribe to. A computer nerd giving a presentation online. His glasses are brown. Let's see if that works. It works fairly, fairly fast, uh, has been optimized to work fairly fast. And that's uh, okay, that's kind of kind of me-ish. Like, okay, here we're tie. Um now 3D render, let's say it's not so it's not a comic style. Uh, so see slightly different. I can I could also show you now if at the time I can you can even customize that and put your own image in, in this and so on. Now finally. Uh, what about risks and biases, right? You have seen like hate speech gets generated, all those problems that you see. So the Azure OpenAI and other um, vendors, they have different ways how you can try, they try to protect you. For example, they use filters on the input 
and try to detect is there hate speech in there. They try to use filters on your output. Is there hate speech in there? And also the models have been trained to give you, let's say, more harmless results. So if you tell a model like tell, Andreas, I'm tell, just gonna give you a five minute warning, all right? Yeah, like, yep. So tell me how to build, let's say, an explosive device. It probably will tell you, well, as an AI model, this is illegal and I cannot help you with this. Or even give me legal advice. It may say I cannot provide legal advice to you or medical advice. It will probably say no. Um, and this is um, has two faces, right? The models initially, when they're trained, have no understanding of good and evil in the sense of what we want. They would just repeat a complete things we ask it to do. So this is called alignment, and sometimes it, the vendors have been criticized to overline. A side effect is that aligned models have been shown to not be as smart in some basic tests as the unaligned models. When you hear the GPT-4 pass like the bar exam for lawyers or the USMLE for doctors, they, as far as we know, worked on the unaligned um, models that have not been, let's say, taught what is good and what is evil. Then there, are, then there are a lot of interesting ways how you can try to make models more safe. Um, and But you need to be understanding what does safe mean to you. For example, there's a group that researched how can we, how where the model is stored that the Space Needle is in Seattle. Um, and can we change that? Can we move it to Rome, for example? And what would it mean? Do then all buildings suddenly are in Rome? Is everything in Rome? Is nothing in Rome? Does the space need to not exist anymore? So the people who are researching how you can do different things, how you can increase um, risk, how you can decrease risks in in your in the model behavior. Biases also exist. Um, a base model would probably tell you like um, the doctor went home and then um, and it would most likely complete with he asked. Like uh, an aligned model may say um, they asked or would alternate he or she. So there are a lot of things where biases come from the training data. And I understand we are pretty much at time. So I want to open it in this little time we have left to questions and answers. Um, and um, I'm happy to chat online more about this. I have so much content I could have talked for hours, but we need to focus here um, on um, the time slots a little bit. So. I hope I gave you a little bit of an idea about this um, like um, foundation of what's behind all of this. Right now, I don't see any questions in chat, so. Yes, I don't see any questions in chat. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. And if not, I'm available here. You can also find me in social mm -hmm. media. I'm. Um, I even saw my business as services, uh, our business has DNA as services. Um, I'm help, I'm trying to be helpful as much as I can, right? So, well, if not, then um, I can I can give you maybe a little outlook. What's coming in the future, right? What's coming in the future? One of the the coolest things um, that's happening in in Chat GPT is um, that you is a concept of basically creating a tool, let's say GPT-4 here, and, and executing it. A tool meaning that some program, uh, meaning from program code, um, sorry, uh, let's say, uh, sorry, that was the wrong thing, using the last minute of my time. I upload a random zip file and ask you like, what is that and analyze it, please, anything wrong with it? So it's just some random zip file, but there's something in that zip file. So what's happening here, it's generating Python code and it's able to execute that Python code in a sandbox and then interact on those results. So it creates some files and oh yes, it's some, okay, let's analyze it further. And um, it continues to analyze it, execute some tools. And those tools here, this code, you could save it and maybe reuse it later on. So that's a big trend in AI models that the generative AI that you create tools and then um, maybe reuse those tools somewhere. Or tell the model, hey, you have some tools you can use, like similar to the plugins and functions. And here it analyzes basically, hey, the Visual mm -hmm. Studio solution, the Windows Forms application. And now it could, it's like, is there anything wrong with it? Um, what does the UI do? And now it is probably 
able to now trying to look at the code behind in the UI because it has understanding, well, it's GPT-4 behind the scene, of, of this. So it basically loads the, um, the program here and looks at the form CS and what it says, like what it has, uh, the event handlers and so on and so forth. I think we are at time. So, um, yes, yes but, we are. So that, this gives you an outlook where, where, where we're going. And this is also a powerful tool for exploring your own data. You can basically also work on Excel data and graph it and plot it. Like play around with it if you have access to it. Um, mm. I highly encourage you. That gives you an understanding of what's next in Generative AI. Thank you for your attention. And with that, I give back to the moderator. All right, thank you very much for your time and expertise here, Andreas. It was a very interesting look at um, all the different large language models and sort of a, a good understanding of how the underlying actions that they are all based on originate from. All so right. thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully next time with a lot more cool hands-on stuff.